here's the thing, Uber, doing, doing ride share, I'll say in general, because I started with Lyft and then I made the switch to Uber, they're basically the same, but how I make it work is I literally drive every day. Yeah. And, and it really depends on what else is going on in my life that determines how much I drive. In some respects, what I really like about doing this is that, you know, I have a lot of freedom, right? Because there's a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm. So I'm not stuck mm -hmm. in one place at an office somewhere. You know, my office is like one of the most beautiful cities in the world. You know, and that, that's just endlessly impressive. You know, like I, I'll end up somewhere that I've never been, I've never seen. And I'm just like, wow. And I feel like a new kid again who's just showing up to San Francisco, like, wow, this exists, this is here. You know, like, you know, say for example, going to the botanical gardens for the first time, you see that redwood cove. That, but of driving, the equivalent of that is like just going to these cool little parks, seeing all these. That's how, like, when I was, because I've been doing this now for four years, and that's how I found out like all these different parks around the city to take my daughter to go play at. You know, <laughs> like that's really so, so I, I used the job to like you know help my parenting to some degree. I mean, the other, the other thing, the other thing that, that I like about it, that I think is impressive, is it it affords me that opportunity on occasion to connect with other people who are in the city, and they happen to get in my car. Like, mm -hmm. what happened with you? For example. <laughs> um, it happens somewhat regularly. I mean, not all the time. You know, oftentimes I'll just get in the car, and people don't want to talk at all; they're just silent. But yeah, a lot of times there's just people that they just want to connect with other people who live in the area. You know, and uh, so if you got a chance, will you choose another kind of like career to earn money or something like that? Well, that's that's the unfortunate thing, you know. Is this job paid a lot better? I, I think I'd be okay just doing it, you know. But mm -hmm. it doesn't. And same thing with my my adjunct professor position is it does it doesn't pay well enough just so they could sustain me on its own. If I was full time, maybe, but I'm not, and that's a whole situation mm -hmm. into itself that's well documented. You know? What do you mean by one generation? I mean, uh, one generation says, you know, our theory about the world is X, and you know, the next generation says our theory about the world is Y. Um, but within both of those generations, doesn't it assume that everybody in the first generation thinks X and everybody in the second generation thinks Y? He does seem to make that assumption. There's consensus. Yeah, the, the, and that's, that's actually what establishes a paradigm. When they're kind of in between paradigms, they're, everybody's looking for you know the ways to elaborate and establish their theory, and then that's what it is. So there's enough of a consensus. We have a paradigm, not normal science yet, but just paradigm. One of my favorite philosophers is David Hume. He was 17th century philosopher, I believe. And uh, what I really love about him is, in my estimation, I like to think of him as kind of like the punk rocker of philosophers of his day. You know? he, he, he was in the early modern period, so like, you know, humanity had just jumped out of the dark ages. And there was lots of progress and everything going on around him. And everybody was jumping on the bandwagon of like, the new sciences, this is where it's all at. This is gonna get us everything, guarantees us knowledge of everything, right? And he wanted that for philosophy as well, you know, but he noticed that the trouble with philosophy was that it got caught up in a bunch of like meaningless arguments about stuff that didn't really matter to anybody. You know, that it had any kind of impact. There's a lot of chaos going on in this brain, you know. So I also constantly hearing riffs or lyrics, you know, like uh, so much so that I've taken my phone now and whenever a lyric hits me I have this note that I call lyric ideas and I'll just jot down the idea 
I'm putting them go back and do whatever I'm doing. Yeah. I'm always I'm always just thinking about something. Hey Mikey! Hi, Mikey. How Sorry are you doing? I'm doing alright. How you been, Betty? Good. How's it going? Uh, good. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. Have you guys ever been in a rehearsal space? <laughs> this is kind of like... This is uh, cool. This is kind of like every space in America. That's Betty. Hi, guys, how are what? you? I mean, you can still hear it. You go, that sounds like this, and then you just try to yeah. find it. Like, uh, when, when I started playing drums, I did the hardest thing, I guess. I thought I could learn the John Bottom. Well, I did, actually, ultimately. Um, I guess I guess what you're asking is like do I want the band to be like a vehicle to become successful or is it just the art my my, my expression and it's my expression now for sure you know when I was in the other bands I mean we weren't necessarily trying to get successful I mean here's the thing it's hard to explain that you know because the the, the rock and roll scene at least the, the greater national rock and roll scene in the United States is kind of like a giant family you know and when you jump into that and you start touring, you start meeting all these people, you start finding out like, it's like this, like the little scene that you had in your own city, it's happening all around the United States and you make friends with all of them. So it's kind of like your extended family. When, and so every time you go out on tour, it's just like going to visit friends and family almost, you know? So it's a lifestyle more than anything. It's not, a lot of people look at it like, like, oh, you're still doing the band thing and you're this old or whatever. You know?
good luck with that. And it's like, no, it's not. It's not like that at all. It's not like we're, we all have these delusions that we're going to make it, you know? Everybody's aware that, hey, if we actually write something that people enjoy, then maybe something will happen. And who wouldn't? Who wouldn't welcome that? But for the most part, it really is like doing it for the passion of just doing it. You know, like the way there are people who are so crazy about mountain climbing. They like give up everything in their lives. They'll just work crap jobs and just travel places to climb rocks, you know? I mean, and for them, that's, that's they found like meaning in their life doing that. And I think that's what's going on, at least with rock and roll and the rock and roll music scene. Um, pe- people, people find meaning just doing it, not, not trying to be something or bigger and all this. You just like try and do it. Hopefully, get to the point where you can write something that when you're dead, you know, some people, people be like, yeah, this band, like the way we were with the Stooges or the MC5 or the Ramones, you know, like, of course, not that big. Those guys are obviously, but I mean, at least somewhere on, on, on like that, you know. So, for example, you know, like I'll drive, like I said, every day of the week, but they're, during the week, start of the week, like Mondays. You know, uh, if if uh, I don't take my daughter's school, it's our neighbors, and I'll start driving. You know, seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning, and then I'll drive for a few hours, maybe up to twelve thirty. You know, maybe one o'clock, and that's when I take my break. Because then at two, I have to pick up my daughter from school, right? Mm-hmm. So, at two, or at two, I have to leave because I give myself a half hour because I might end up anywhere in the city. So I always try and give myself a half hour cushion to, you know, get my daughter. So that's why I make sure like at two o'clock, that's when I stop whatever I'm doing, I go get my daughter. But yeah, I do that and then I'll take her, like on Mondays, I don't have to take her to after school program. So we'll go home, we'll chill for a little bit and then she has ballet class. So mm-hmm. at four, at 4.45, so like at 4.15, we leave our house and go across town to her ballet class. Mm-hmm. And then from there, she and I come here to, to school because I have to teach I pack all my things and I wait for my wife to get off work and she'll come and pick up my daughter sometimes while I'm in the middle of teaching and my daughter's there drawing I'll have her sit in class um, and she often and I kind of prefer that not happen because invariably she'll always get up and start talking what do you mean by this daddy she's like interrupting <laughs> I'm like oh baby don't worry she says look at my unicorn and it's like mm-hmm. All right, that's really cute. That's cool. Okay, sit over here. Okay, I'm trying to do something. <laughs> She's like, okay, and then she goes and sits down. You know, so it was that that happens. It it really varies. And then on Tuesdays, like today, you know, I'll today um, recently. What ha- I should explain is what recently what happened is we made some friends with some other parents at, at my daughter's school, and so we kind of do this like we switch off and taking the kids to school in the mornings. So on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, they take my daughter, and on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I take their kid and my daughter so like on Tuesdays that's what work looks like at 7 45 me and my daughter are out the door we go pick up that other kid I take him to school and then, uh, then they're usually there by like 8 15 or 8 20 mm-hmm. and then I'll start driving from there right yeah. and then I'll drive I try and drive to like about 10 o'clock and the reason for that is because you know I want to give myself time to get get back home gather my things for class and read the materials and try and prepare the lecture uh, truth be told, whenever I'm doing Uber, I'm also constantly thinking about all kinds of things. All the problems in my life, you know, my relationship, uh, thinking about, you know, what I got to get from Trader Joe's or Costco, uh, thinking about bills that I got to pay. And then the bigger things that I'm thinking about are like my lectures, you know, because when I'm doing Uber, there's oftentimes, you know, some, some, some dead space. And in, in that, that time, I'm either driving around looking for a ride or I'm j- I'll just park somewhere and wait for a request to come in. And while I'm waiting or driving around, I'm thinking about my lectures, I'm thinking about the book or the article that, that I had them read, I'm trying yeah. to think about how to say things. You know? So, like I said, I just maximize my time all the time. 